So it seems though I'm always telling stories and people are asking me, hey Mike, where did that story come from? And was that story before this one? So we decided we're gonna answer all those questions. Stories from the Road is coming up next. Hi everybody, this is Mike from 1614 Fitness and we are about to start Stories from the Road. We're gonna share how 1614 begun and where all these crazy stories kind of fit in a sequential order in my life. So let's get it started. But before we do, I want you to pay special attention to two things. First, see if you can find any, what we'll call butterfly effects. If you look up the phrase butterfly effect, which I did, and it's filled with huge words in this crazy convoluted definition that just baffled me. But to keep it simple, simply the butterfly effect is this. When something very small, a small occurrence happens and as a result causes a huge change, a huge change in potentially your life, history, that's the butterfly effect. So keep your eyes open for stories that may include the butterfly effect. Secondly, I want you to pay attention to when or keep an eye on when bad things, when a bad twist or a bad accident, something not good turns out to be a blessing. If I was a fast forward, I would tell you that in my days in corporate America, I worked at MBNA America and I was in charge of the new higher education process. During that process, we had to learn about the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, how to communicate, how to be professional, and the different things that we needed to do at MBNA to help us minimize loss. At the end of a two-week edu education program, we would do a final exam. We then would invite very big wigs to come in and have lunch with the new hires. That would give the new hires an opportunity to ask questions. It was also an opportunity for the big wigs, the bosses, to check out the new talent, to see who was going where, and just to get to know everybody. But after lunch, every session, Every time we had a new hire class, we did the same thing, and I think it was a great idea. We would play a video from Lou Holtz, or when Lou Holtz come to the main campus to speak to the SOC members. We filmed it, and we used it in every new hire education class. I must have seen that tape. Yeah, I said tape to all you young folks. A tape was a VHS tape that actually spun tape fast forward, and it makes me feel old. But we used a VHS tape to do that. I seen that tape anywhere from 75 to 100 times. And even the first time I saw that tape with Lou Holtz, this one story really resonated with me and come to find out it would play a big part of the rest of my life. He talks about their years as they were becoming a, a national powerhouse again, just before they would go on to win a national championship. One of their cornerstones, I believe, now I'm gonna get a few of these things wrong, so if you know the story, please don't batter me for being slightly off, but the premise is certainly correct. One of the cornerstones, I believe, for the offensive line was just an absolute stud. He was able to lead and just be a tremendous asset to that offensive line. In practice, just before the beginning of the season, he goes down to a nasty knee injury. They're standing on the sideline, and I believe it was the offensive line coach approaches Coach Holtz and says, well, Coach, this is bad. And coach Holtz calmly responded, well, it don't look good, but we're going to have to see how this works itself out. Come to find out, the red shirt freshman that would come fill his shoes would go on to have a remarkable year. A remarkable year and a remarkable career. The injured player comes back the following year, they trade positions and they go on to have an amazing year and it may very well have been the year they won a national championship. Don't quote me on that. But bottom line is, one player goes down, two all-stars are created and they eventually go on to win a national championship. That's a great example of one of those cases where something tragic seems to have happened but something remarkably good comes from it. So keep your eyes open for those two things, butterfly effect and when something bad goes right, all right? All right, so let's get to starting. My world really didn't start till after graduation. Graduation high school, of course. I mean, I was normal, I went to high school, I did my thing, I participated, I had a really good time, but nothing earth shattering. Nothing really happened that would mold my life until college. In fact, my second semester in college is when things really started to happen, and this is when I had my first of many bad circumstances turn right. Here it goes. So I remember clearly, I lived at home my freshman year. 
And I did so because I wanted to make sure that I stayed focused on college because that's important, right? I didn't want any temptation that could lead me astray and prevent me from being a scholar that I ended up being. There's a lot of irony, just stay tuned. So anyway, I'm in the kitchen and I decided to go get the mail. My mom was in the kitchen doing something, I don't remember, but I remember she was there. I grabbed the mail, I come back in, I'm standing there, I'm kind of flipping through, nothing, nothing, huh. There's something from the University of Delaware. Well, since I, I didn't think I was on the honor roll, I was kind of curious as to what this could be. I opened it up, and as I'm reading it, my mom says, what's that? Oh, I don't know, Mom. It's from the University of Delaware. I'm reading it. Oh. My mom says, what's going on? What's that? I said, Ma, I just got a relocation package from the University of Delaware. And it didn't really register what I was talking about just yet. And she says, a relocation package? What do you mean? Well, it seems as though the University of Delaware wants to relocate my academic prowess onward and elsewhere. I'm no longer welcome at the University of Delaware. That didn't go over so well with mom. And I'm pretty sure she called dad right away and that didn't go so well either. And it beat me up when I read it. I think mostly because, you know, when you're a kid, and listen, when you're 18, 19 years old, in my world, you're still a kid. When you're a kid and you have bad news that you gotta share with mom and pop, you wanna have that bad news in like your own room or in the woods so you can prepare how you're gonna handle this. You don't wanna have this bad experience in front of your mom. I was dealing with live without a net. I just blurted out, yep, got relocated, I'm out. And then my mom's wheels fell right off the bus. It was not good. But it didn't beat me up that badly, not yet but it would. A couple days go by and all of a sudden I realized what had happened. I realized that I, I, I had no direction. I had nowhere to go. I had no, nowhere to go. Think about high school. Late summer, I went to football camp. Fall, I played football. Winter, I played basketball. Spring, I played baseball. And in the summer, I got a job and then I started the whole thing over. It's like, a, like getting a a cycle, it was just what I did. There was always somewhere to go. There was direction. First time in my life, I don't remember, 18, 19 years old, whatever it was, a year, a semester and a half at Delaware, I had no direction. I had to figure this thing out and I had to figure it out quickly. My dad then comes to me and says, hey, while you're figuring this out, there's an opportunity you might wanna look into. I says, all right, what's that? There's a job opening right down the road. You actually drive cars off the lot at Chrysler onto rail cars at the station. They then take those cars to wherever they gotta go and disperse them to dealerships. So of course, my first question was how much? Now keep in mind, I'm an old dude. So we're talking 30 years ago. 30 years ago, so keep that in perspective when I drop this number on you. I'm 18 years old, I think. My dad says, well, they start you out at $12 an hour, and after you get certified and get everything squared away, you'll be in about mm, 12 months, you'll be 17, 17, 15 an hour. I start doing the math. I'm like, dude, you're kidding, right? He's like, no. You gotta drive the cars up, do boom, boom, done, $17 an hour, 18 months minimum. Yeah, I'm in. Because I'm thinking, dude, I didn't even go to college and I'm making some serious coin. So I go, I do the drug test, I do the interview, I do all that stuff, and then the, I remember the first car. So I get in the car, and it says like zero or 0.5 on the odometer, which I think is pretty cool. You know, it was like 100 years ago, it was like a K car or something. And then so I back up and the guy's showing me what to do. Well, say the car is this wide. The train that I'm putting it on is like that wide. And I am sure I'm ripping a fender off this thing. And then I then realized they kind of stagger the cars. So one will go like that, and one will go like that, and when you do the one that goes like that, you don't know where you're driving. You're looking up in the sky and they keep tell you to keep going. I know I'm gonna drive this thing right off the end of this train. But as the day goes on and I get myself settled and driving is no longer a challenge, it starts to dawn on me that I've made a tremendous mistake. I realized while driving that car that I desperately wanted to graduate from college. And I was kicking myself in the butt because the lot that I was driving was right next door. Actually, now it's right in the middle of the University of Delaware campus. And I screwed it all up.
I screwed it all up because I didn't have focus, I didn't have direction, and I didn't have my arms around a goal, and now I'm in trouble. So I realized I gotta pick myself up by my bootstraps and do something, but I don't know what to do. Here I am, I've committed to this job. My dad kinda put himself out, and I don't know what to do. That night, I come home, and my dad, with great pride, says, you got a little grease on your shirt there, son. I went, yeah, I do. And I felt like I had more. I remember eating dinner. I remember staring at the ceiling that entire night. These are the thoughts floating through my little brain here. I screwed up college. I failed out. I am the worst at failing of anybody I know. If you ask my buddies who I love dearly, my biggest fault, they will tell you, I deal with failure, I don't do it well. I'm 47 years old and to this day, every day of my life, I fight to be better and better and better at handling challenges and handling failure. I don't like to lose and I don't do a good job of it. So I was beating myself up. Then I'm also beating myself up, I don't have a college to go to. And then maybe more than anything, I was beating myself up because my dad went out of his way to get me hooked up and I really in my heart of hearts knew that I had to walk away and find a way back to college. So maybe sleeping 40 minutes that night, I get up at four o'clock, I met my dad in the hallway and I said, Dad, I'm sorry, but when I go to work today, I'm gonna to tell Mr. Jones that today's my last, well, I'm giving my two weeks. He just looked at me and I don't know what emotion he had, but I felt that he had disappointment and it ate me up, ate me up terribly. But I believed in my heart I needed to graduate from college. It's what I felt I needed to do. I wanted to do, it's, it was on my list. And I knew if I stayed working there, making twenty-five dollars to $35,000 a year, at that point in my life, I was done. I'd never go back. It was now or never. I knew it, it was time to change. So my dad sighed, he looked at me, and that was that. Went to work, put on my two weeks. I immediately had to find out about a school. The best option at the time was Dell Tech. They were starting just about the time my two weeks ended and it all worked out. I didn't have much money in my pocket, but Dell Tech was the most affordable at the time. I wanna say I could afford to take three classes. I think four was full-time, but I think I could afford because after I decided to go back to college, or college, after I decided to go back to college, my dad, very lovingly looked at me and said, son, you screwed up college. I'm never paying for college. You've got to learn. Live here as long as you want. Eat as much of your food as you want. You'll never pay rent. You live here as long as you want, but you got to figure out college on your own. Was that a tough lesson? You're darn right it was. Was it an amazing lesson? Darn right it was. Was it probably the second one of them when the bad thing turns right? Yep, I think so too. Because that taught me money management. It taught me how to budget. I thank him all the time. He doesn't know it, but I thank him all the time because it was a lesson well learned. So I go back to college. I go to Dell Tech with three classes because that's all I can afford. And if you want to change your focus on college, I encourage you to pay for it. Because if somebody else is paying for college, not that big a deal. But I wrote a check out for those three courses at Dell State and I'll be darned if I was gonna fail. So life changed. And it was right around that time that I got direction. Because before when I said in high school, I always had somewhere to go. There was football, there was basketball, there was baseball. And I knew before long, we were gonna start it all over again. I knew where to go, I knew what to do. For the first time in my life, nobody was telling me what to do and I made bad decisions. I didn't do well at that aspect of life. And remember how I told you I don't do well at failure? Well, maybe this was good because I failed and I was darned if it was gonna happen again. So there I go, Dell Tech and I'm studying, I'm getting good grades and all of a sudden, I felt like I, I had direction. All of a sudden, I felt like making that decision about not working there any longer was a good one. So here's what happens. One of the classes that I had to take when I say had to take, there wasn't a lot available because I registered so late. But one of those classes was a public speaking class. And I never did really much any public speaking. It was never my thing. I never had to do it in high school. I, I did some, I did school plays and this and that. 
And uh, so it wasn't a big deal to me. So when I was told that was one of the only classes available, no big deal. I took it. And to this day, I remember the guys in the class. We had a good time. And I remember it came fairly easily to me. I'm not saying I'm good at it, but it was easy. And it was enjoyable. And I understand how it's supposed to work. And then through that course, I think I found out the direction I wanted to go. Through that course, I realized that, you know what? I think I know what I want to do. I want to get into radio. I've always liked radio. I've always had a, a curiosity for how it worked and how the ratings impacted dollars and cents. And I'm like, you know what? This is it. It's my direction. I'm going to get into radio. I've got to find a school that offers communication. So my college career continued, but at least I had in the back of my head direction. I was going to school. I had direction. I wanted to go into a school with communications. I needed to learn how to do that. First time in a long time that I had direction. And quite frankly, I felt it was the first time in my life that I had my direction. I just always played sports. So it wasn't a question of whether or not I was going to play. It was just whatever sport was X. So that was direction, but it wasn't self-driven. This started with me and was going to end with me. I was going to go to a major school or a school that had a major communications. That was my goal. And life was good. I felt better about it. So I had to get a job. I ended up finding a job working part-time at a rate or at a uh, video store. They don't even have video stores anymore. Come to find out, my, my best friend from my middle school days worked there. That is how I paid for my first two years in Dell Tech. He and I worked at a place called Hollywood Home Videos on Route 40. We had a great time. It allowed me the opportunity to study, which by the way, I did. I studied a ton because I was writing the checks and everything was good. Well, my world was about to get changed forever. And it was about to get changed forever in the most unlikely of ways. Keep in mind the butterfly effect because it's coming. So the buddy I, I went to school with and, and just kind of hung out and played sports with, his name was Tommy. We fished, we, we, we did a lot of fun things together. And we, we continued to be good buddies throughout uh, our college days. And we had, and yeah, he was with me when the University of Delaware went south, so we had some fun, probably too much. One day, out of the blue, Tommy calls me and says, hey, listen, I joined a gym, I want you to come with me, it's a great time. Now, let's rewind a little bit. Tom and I would hang out on weekends and go play basketball, and we'd go lift weights. Our idea of lifting weights was bench pressing and doing curls in his basement or bench pressing and doing curls in my basement on our way to or from shooting baskets somewhere. That's what we did to lift weights. Didn't really know anything about it. So that being said, I go, wait a minute, what are you going to do? He says, dude, I've, I got a membership to this gym. It's in Newark. It's probably six miles from your house. You, we've got to go, man. It's unbelievable. I'm like, well, I am pretty much a stud. Let's go. I'm gonna take my athletic prowess to high energy, the gym. Listen, I hope to heavens some guys and gals who went to high energy are watching this episode right now. Because if you are, we're gonna be able to share a few fun moments that that wonderful gym created. So I said, Tom, I'm in. I don't work Wednesday night, making that up. I'll meet you down there at five, making that up. So I go get the keys to the Airflow chassis. Now, if you don't know what the Airflow chassis is, my first car was a 1972 lime green two-door Ford Maverick with Airflow chassis. And if, again, you don't know what Airflow chassis mean, it means you've got rust holes in the front quarter panel, you got rust holes in the back quarter panel, and when you drive, you got yourself some Airflow chassis. That's what's going on. But that's not the only thing that was great about that car. It had plastic seats. They didn't even dress it up by saying they were vinyl. They were just straight up plastic. If it's 82 degrees outside, those seats were 147 degrees and would rip the skin off the back of your thigh. It was a ridiculous car. It had a converter that would convert an AM radio into FM. And if the wind blew south, the moon was full and I wasn't driving fast, I could actually get a local radio station. It was a train wreck of a car, but I loved it. So I'm driving down 72 on the way to high energy. I'm feeling good, feeling pretty cocky, a little fool of myself. I've got a job, I've got a 
college. I've got direction. Life is good. So he says, listen, go down Chapel Street. It's on the right-hand side. It's in an old warehouse. Listen, to say that high energy was in an old warehouse is, uh, it's a lipstick on a, it was, it was a dilapidated hole that was terrifying. I'm driving, I look to my right, and I see these people. And they got clothes on if they had shirts at all. They had cut up handmade string tank tops cut off and they were all huge. They looked like the Wonder Twin Powers and they looked like, the, it was scary. It was ridiculous. They were all huge. They all looked like Superman. And in the middle of them stood this dog. If a dog could be pumped, this dog was pumped. It, his name was Buster. I grew to love this dog. It was a boxer that had muscle upon muscle and was just a wonderful creature. It would literally walk up to a bench, lay its jowls levelly on the bench and fall asleep. Loved the dog. But the first time I met him, I was terrified of him and those people. So I pull into the parking lot, which was nothing more than a gravel pit with a fence that wasn't even directly across the street from the gym. I drive in and as I'm pulling in, I honestly, kid you not, I see a man doing push-ups in a mud puddle. I pull in and now I'm just stunned. I don't know what to think. That right there are the people that go to the gym. Where does that dog go? And why is this guy doing push-ups in a mud puddle? I'm sitting there trying to gather myself. Tom walks right up to me and says, hey dude, you ready? <laughs> ready? For what? You want me to walk by that guy doing push-ups in a mud puddle, and you want me to walk through those guys into the gym? If that's what it looks like outside the gym, I don't want to know what it looks like inside the gym. Uh-uh. Nope, not doing it. I pulled the uh, airflow chassis out, drove home. I went downstairs in my basement and commenced to lifting weights with Ted Williams weights. What's that for all you young people? Sears and Roebuck had a sporting department, and everything was Ted Williams. I lifted those concrete weights, you know, this plastic and they're filled with concrete. It was like a 110 pound weight set. I worked out on those bad boys for a month and a half. Probably didn't get a lick stronger, didn't do a thing for me. But about a month and a half later, I call up Tom and I go, Tom, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go to high energy. We end up going to high energy and I don't know why, but I want to say we paid $235. I walk in there. I love you, Stacy and Chris. I'm telling you right now, they're the owners. God bless them both. God bless Stacy. To say that it wasn't clean was a tremendous understatement. The floor had a pitch to it in the bathroom. The shower was green because photosynthesis was taking place in the shower stall. It was, it was a hole. It was the most intimidating, scary, steel, men yelling, screaming, dog running around thing I had ever seen in my life. And it was wonderful. It was fantastic. It was my home for 20 years. It was wonderful. I can't begin to tell you how much I loved it. I can't begin to tell you the friendships I made. I can't begin to tell you the passion that in those walls was developing inside of me. So Tom Williams calls me and says, let's go to a gym. I say no. Somehow I end up going back. And thank heavens I did because my life was forever changed walking through those doors. Because that dog loved. The guy doing push-ups, we've talked. Those guys at the door, I hung out with them at a, uh, at a happy hour this past weekend. I've made lifelong friends from those guys and I began a passion a passion for fitness, a passion for the gym business, a passion for helping people. And yeah, you can't imagine how that happens in a gym like that, but it did. How did it happen? Come check out the next episode and we'll tell you how it happened. High Energy Gym taught me a ton. It gave me a passion and we're gonna talk about that passion in the very next episode. I will see you 